Ya ayyatuhan nafsun mutmain. Arabic terms, there is another terminology, it's called nafs. Why is it important? The word psyche from the Greek, that means soul. Pathos from the Greek is suffering, is the protest of the psyche when it's being ignored or violated. To, to keep the appointment with your own soul. And if you don't, then it begins to pathologize. The greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent. Wherever the parent has been stuck in their shadow, the child inherits that. It begins to take on a different flavor when you realize that psychotherapy is about listening or attending to the voice of the soul. Hello and welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics powered by American Muslim Today. Today, we're very excited to introduce our esteemed guest in our studios, Dr. James Hollis, a distinguished Jungian psychoanalyst and author. Dr. Hollis earned his degree from Manchester University and Drew University and spent 26 years teaching humanities before training as a Jungian analyst at the Young Institute in Zurich. Dr. Hollis currently lives in Washington, D.C. and teaches psychoanalysts. He has numerous leadership roles, including executive director of the Young Educational Center and the Young Society of Washington. He has also many publications and presented at many national and international seminars. Dr. Hollis is a professor of Jungian Studies at Saybrook University and has authored over 20 books, which have been translated into many languages, um, reflecting his profound impact on deaf psychology. Dr. Hollis works delves into key Jungian concepts such as persona, ego, which is an Islamic context can be understood as the self or the soul. That represents an outward individual um, identity present to the world. The shadow, as we call it, Karin in Arabic, is a Jungian psychology akin to the Islamic notion of inner self hidden aspects, reflects the unconscious side of our personality, including repressed weaknesses and desires. His exploration of the psyche, the ruh, aligns with the Islamic understanding of the soul, which encompasses our spiritual essence and inner reality. Dr. Hollis also emphasizes the significance of dreams, which both from Jungian and Islamic perspective are seen as a window into the conscious mind and a source of divine guidance and introspection. The introspection so as to be the Marakaba or the self-inspection of ones. Jungian psychology developed by Dr. Carl Jung focused deeply on the psyche and the introspections. Dr. Hollis continues his exploration with great depth and clarity, bridging these profound psychological concepts with spiritual insight. So let's get to Dr. Hollis and dive into the discussion we had with him today on these numerous topics. So we're going to get right to Dr. Hollis. Dr. Hollis, welcome to our studios and to our podcast today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So Dr. Hollis, let's get, we're going to get right into the, uh, the questions. And please do explain to us first a little bit about the self S, the S with the self and the sense of self. Well, first of all, when we talk about the nomenclature of analytic psychology, we need to think of those terms as verbs, not nouns. And I, I make that distinction because there are labels we put on energy processes. The, the, the psyche is in fluid, it's, it's flow, it's energy, and it's constantly moving. And what Jung and other depth psychologists have tried to do to sort of map that flow, just as physicians try to map the circulation of the body, so if we, we think of the self, when we use that term, the first thing that comes to our mind in our culture is, well, that's who I am. That's myself. That's really the ego speaking to itself. And the ego is an old Latin term that means I, who I think I am at the moment. The I is, is a cluster of energy that it, we're not born with it. We begin to accrete it by the 
experience of being split off, you know, before birth, presumably, we're, we're walking through the sleep states of the universe, all our needs met, we're violently expelled into this world, and slowly begin to realize the me and the not me, and the I and the thou, and that sort of thing. And that's how the ego begins to form. So the ego at any given moment has a sense of itself. When Jungian psychologists talk about the self with a capital S, to try to distinguish it from the ego's sense of self, they're really talking about the whole person. You know, Descartes famously said, uh, in trying to solve the question, do I really even exist? Is this some sort of dream? He said, I think, therefore I am. Well, that was the ego splitting itself off from the organism of nature that's continuing to, to be nature. But in any given the moment, the ego can be occupied by some other kind of psychological energy, you know, split off. So, for example, um, you know, when you're a child, you're told not to touch the oven. It's too hot. Well, sooner or later, a child's going to do that. And it now has an experience that it incorporates within itself. And it can begin to recognize certain shiny objects that may be attractive, could also be threatening in some way, too. So it, that becomes what is called a complex now, a complex is a neutral word, like apartment complex, airport complex. It's a cluster of energy, but it has a value to it. Is it positive? Is it negative? All right. Um, is it helpful to you? Is it harmful to you? So even when I speak as myself, well, which part of me is speaking? Is it the frightened child who is speaking? Is it the compliant personality that is speaking? And as we all know, we... we Early on, start reading the world around us. Is it safe? Is it unsafe? Can I approach you, the parent? Do I need to keep my distance? What happens when I express my needs? Do you run to support and help me? Or, or are you absent or you get angry or punitive or whatever? We all develop operative, reflexive, protective systems to help us adjust to life, the out of harm's way, and get our needs met as best we can. And we take that, though, and put it in different life situations. And then you begin to realize from time to time, you know, maybe the choice I made or the pattern that I'm unfolding in my adult life is really driven by some of those earliest experiences or, or uh, sort of perspectives that the child had. And so <clears throat> if our we are creatures of adaptation, as you know, and, and because we can adapt, we can fit into the circumstances around us sooner or later with varying degrees of effectiveness. But the more we adapt to what is outside of us, the more we begin to separate from the natural organism that each of us is, as a creature of nature, right? as, a, as a functioning animals. So we can say the conscious part of me, the ego, only has a small insight into the magnitude of the operations that are going on constantly in our brains and our emotions and, and physiology and so forth. And at the same time, it's a self-governing system. And so what are the operative systems within it? And that depends to some degree on what our nature is seeking to express in the world. And to some degree, how we formulate a sense of self. You know, am I to keep my mouth shut? Am I to comply with what people ask of me? What is it that I need to do to fit in, get my needs met, and so forth? And so that's where I come in, you know, is trying to sort through all of that traffic to discern what is the natural self seeking in this person's life. A self that is unconscious mm -hmm. and that's not governed as per your definition, you know, and that mm -hmm. there is a sense of self, it's called ego. Yes. Of it is ego. And in Arabic terms, there is another terminology, it's called nafs. Then on mm -hmm. your self part, your S capital self, which is unconscious, there is a concept again of, like you just mentioned, of psych, psyche just alluded to it and then there's a lot of mention of ru being uh in the in the arabic version or the islamic version the mention of ru descriptively coming in repeatedly parallels with the psychoanalysis now yes we're talking now two different parallels something 1400 years ago given and you, we mm -hmm. the modern psycho um, uh, psycho energy talking about ru could you could you explain a little bit about that part to us mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. psychoanalysis terms how does that come about your and then we'll look at the definition of it because you've mentioned in your books a number of times how it's an organic being mm -hmm. it has feelings and it's mm -hmm. autonomous it's independent mm -hmm. and for some reason it does not 
go parallel with your it's an organic being but not a worldly sort of organic it's 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 not fulfilled nature wishing to express itself and then being put into an artificial situation such as our cultures are you know our, our commercial operations our, our religious institutions our educational institutions our governmental institutions and so forth and if those systems are supportive of what the psyche wants or the soul wants then you'll feel a sense of belonging support and a sense of wholeness but to the degree they're not then there will be an internal conflict and that's where we experience our, our symptomatology or psychopathology psychotherapy is about listening or attending to the voice of the soul wow mm -hmm. what you might call the divine part of every person that is to say the transpersonal part of every human being what we become is a series of reflexive responses to the challenges of life and and you know patterns of compliance with the pressures of the external world for example or or patterns of avoidance or power complexes that are compensatory and so forth so what you become necessarily so this is not to be judged it's to recognize those adaptations were probably necessary to protect oneself because our adaptations are in service to get our, our needs met as best we can as relatively powerless children and and staying out of harm's way so we learn patterns of avoidance or patterns of compliance to circumstances that are not conducive to our own emotional well-being it's sort of like if you were forced to eat a certain food and and it was not healthy for the body the body is going to register its dismay and it will increase its protest to it finally gets our, our attention and that's often what brings people into uh, psychotherapy i want to just qu quickly quote you and aya um it's from asad uh, 32 9 the, bo the body was fashioned and mm -hmm. Rue was sort of like breathed into it. This, this is exactly yes. the same word. The, the, the root, well, not far from in Rue, Rue was actually put into the body. And mm -hmm. then the human was somehow will basaru alafida, meaning he was given sense of sense of hearing, a sense of eyesight and a fab to think as well, and mm -hmm. a heart surprisingly goes in parallel to what you were just explaining right now about the rue and you have mentioned in your other areas of the book how it sort of flows through the body um, mm -hmm. and it's got like you just mentioned it has its feeling and it mm -hmm. can transform where you meaning from an initial bit to a butterfly you quoted that in your book mm -hmm. so i'm coming to my question now Mm -hmm. The question is how you think the Ru is in the beginning, the psyche was saying Guru. You've mentioned that there is a first half of life and how in the second half of the life, if you do not nourish it, it starts to protest even more. Mm -hmm. So much so that it can lead to other, we'll talk about what it can do. But can you explain a little bit? Do you think that the Ru, when you're young, is naive a little? It's a little abstract, but matures over a period of time. And then it starts asking the question more. When you hear, when, when you can think more, it, it demands more. Certainly. And, and uh, I mean, after all, all the traditions, great religious traditions have been looking at the same phenomenon, which is the phenomenon of humanity. So they, they bring their understanding of what happens to the human being and, and what it means to be human. So there are bound to be these important overlaps because there are going to be uh, insights from all the great traditions about the same thing. They may use different language, different metaphors, but they're headed in the same direction. So just to back up a little bit, we are matter, we are animals. And yet the word animal, anima is Latin for, for, for soul. <laughs> you know, it's like an ensouled animal. That is to say, there's an autonomy to this. And, and that one of the characteristics, see, most of the animal kingdom, to the best of our understanding, is driven by instinct, the instinct to eat, to procreate, to protect itself from uh, predators, etc. But as far as we know, it doesn't create uh, religions, it doesn't create uh, social economic systems, it, it, it doesn't suffer neuroses, it, it can be frightened by predators and act instinctually to protect itself, as we do. But, but it, it doesn't anticipate, let's say, its mortality in a way that humans do. As children, we, we have one message and that life gives us, and it's accurate, actually, and that is the world is big and you're not. The world's powerful and you're not. So how are you going to fit in? 
And so we either give the world what it's asking of us, or we spend our life trying to find ways to get away from it. Either way, we're responding to that rather than something that's coming out of us, which is our natural, instinctual, and spiritual expression. So in the first half of life, we have, as children and young people, the same kinds of frustrations, but generally speaking, the continuing demand of the world is to fit in, you know, to get, a, get an education, uh, leave your parents, get a job, be self-supporting, form commitments in life, perhaps become a parent, all useful and social functions that are necessary to maintain a family and a society. On the other hand, uh, at some point in one's life, and this often happens to people, as you know, they will have done all the right things as they were instructed to do so, or as they believed they were needing to do to fit in. What is the soul asking me? Which is what is the self asking me, rather than what my ego or my complexes are asking of me? And that's a humbling experience. It doesn't make you feel great and on top of the world. It says, I have to go back to the drawing board. That's what took me into six years of analysis in Switzerland. It wasn't that I was planning to change my life. I wasn't planning to change my careers. I moved from academia to, to psychoanalysis as a therapist. Um, it was simply to try to say, how do I get this depression to go away? <laughs> it was as a child, I felt them so strongly. I needed to defend myself against their strength. And of course, things don't go away. They go underground and come up somewhere else. And so I began to realize that in this humbling experience, I thought I'd done the right thing. But my own psyche is protesting. We, we have to question why we rush too quickly to medication to say, well, let's get, have this problem go away rather than say, why has it come to me? Is it possible that my own soul is trying to, to connect to me? Energy system, another, that, that if I'm doing what's right for me, the energy is there. Now, in real life, we have to mobilize energy to get up at three in the morning and change the baby's diaper, or whatever is needed to go to work on time. But if you keep, we all know this, if you keep diverting your energy to places that are hostile to the well-being of your own soul, it's going to show up as boredom, enervation, ultimately self-medication, depression, whatever. And, and thirdly, dream or autonomous reactions. Something in the psyche knows us better than we know ourselves. And I was interested in to find from sleep research that we average about dreams per night. And everybody's going to say, well, I don't dream that much. And I don't remember my dreams. So it's serving some role in nature. Nature doesn't waste energy. And, and secondly, to really pay attention over time, you begin to realize there's an other inside of each of us that is seeking to communicate with us. If you talk in your books about you've got to shut up, suit up, and show up, which means that mentally stop talking about other stuff, but address this issue about the call Mm -hmm. yes. with your soul if you don't do it now you it, it's going to eat you up from inside right. and or it's going to have a bearing and then dr hollis you also mentioned about how often you've got to meditate this is this appointment or addressing the issue has been a med form of meditation we call it salah which is like going into a little prayer domain um mm -hmm. you mentioned that it's probably twice, at least a day, morning, evening, you can break that mm -hmm. out. Could you explain a little bit when you are doing that? And if you are doing that, what are the things you've got to try to address? Well, I had a colleague in um, Ontario, now, now deceased, Mary Woodman, who said, she always told her clients, you, if you're going to work with me, you need to dedicate a minimum of one hour a day to spend time with yourself to meditate, to work with your dreams, to do something that, that responds to your interior. And she said, most people say, oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have that time. Just right. my... And then she said, then you're not ready to really work with your own soul here. In those moments, we, we have two summonses. One is to address what needs to be addressed in our world. First of all, you've always said most of the clients who came to me, and I would find this true, at some level understood what their real task was. But they've been trying to figure out all kinds of ways to avoid that, you know, to, to keep the appointment with your own soul, in other words. And and the um, purpose of the therapy then was to call us back, and you used a very important word, vocation. That's different than job. Job's how you pay your bills. Vocation's what you're called to be as a human being. 
that's a different matter. And sometimes they can come together, but they don't have to necessarily. But the point is, you have appointments with our own schools. Do you keep the appointment? If you don't, then it begins to pathologize. One winds up in self-medication, one winds up dealing with depression, one loads up in medications, or one lives a life of frenetic investment in the outer world, the world of distraction. There are people who have life far worse. So don't whine, just shut up about that. Recognize there are people who, who are having their children killed. There are people who don't have enough food and people have no shelter. Your problems are minimal compared to that. So shut up now. Shut up means do your homework. Do, don't expect things to happen just magically. Do what you need to do to facilitate change and growth and pay your dues. And thirdly, step into life, show up, not show off, show up. Just do the best you can. Stop beating up on yourself, just do the best you can. You have to pull out of the noise, pull out of the traffic to recover a sense of, of self. So I, I try to, before I work with clients every day, I, I spend time with myself and see what my dreams were set the night before or or what's coming up and saying, all right, but what is that really about? But what is really seeking its expression in the world through us? That is not self-absorption, it's not narcissism. It's in fact um, humbling. It means, oh, well, here's another thing I didn't know about myself. I have to pay attention to that. Oh, well, here's something I'm, I'm called to face. And you don't put it this way. He said, there are three pieces to this work of self-healing. He said, first is insight. That's where psychology can help. But he said, from that point on, it really depends on the moral character of that individual. Second, he said, is courage to face whatever tasks life brings us. And thirdly, he said, is endurance, sticking it out over time. Insight, courage, persistence, endurance. Um, and, and when we bring that to the table, we, we regain a sense of purpose and dignity in our lives, even if it's conflictual and, and uh, difficult. I want to quote quickly a ayah from Hud 11.14. Just very quickly. Basically meaning that as establishes your salah. Salah meaning that same same connection, disconnecting from the world and connecting to something else. Do it in at the both extremes of the day, the mornings and the evenings. So it's giving a specific time, just like how you've mentioned in your 24 hours, try to dissociate, break it up into two and then contemplate the day and the night. Because the next bit is very interesting as well, because it also talks about uh, which essentially means the negative, the negativity, the, the, the thoughts that are there. You've got to try to wipe them out. Um, in this specific case, it talks about your negative sins, negative things that you accumulated, because when you are doing that, you're establishing, establishing a little uh, connection. Which brings us to our next bit, is about talking about the shadow or addressing what we call the Karim. Karin mm -hmm. is like your, I want to phrase it a little cautiously, devilish part. The part that we have to be mindful about. While main Yashu, there's another uh, uh, quote, Ayah 4336, which talks about if we, and whoever turns a blind eye to the reminders, he will be at the disposal then of the Karin, the disposal of the devilish one, close to him. And then it specifically says, Shaitan and Fahuwa Lahu Karin. You'll, be, you'll become more near to that part of the shadow of the current. You, Dr. Hollis, also talk about that a lot in your therapy analysis. Would you explain what's connection here with the shadow and how do we have to dispel that off with constant reminder, with, with, with the meditation, that this is exists and needs to be addressed, just like the rule wants something? What we don't address inside of ourselves gets spilled on to our children, uh, to our partners, to our society. So there's a deep moral function in looking at one's own shadow. Because if I don't address it in some way, it keeps spilling into the world onto others. And, and that's a harmful thing to do to others. That's why Jung said once, the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent. Wherever the parent has been stuck in their shadow, the child inherits that. And, often has to either repeat it, which is common, 
or spend their life trying to get away from them. If we're not conscious of them, they just keep spilling into the world. If we are forced to become conscious of them or we invite that dialogue, then we realize that many of the things we do are in service to, say, motives or agendas that are not comfortable to us or may be inconsistent with our values. But you don't want your life governed by your fear responses, right? That's a shadow issue. So if I'm going to unhook my decisions in the outer world, I'm going to have to face my fears. And you can see why that's the reason to keep all of that underground, because I don't want to do that. And that's why it has that autonomy. Or maybe some of my motives are really selfish and manipulative, and I don't want to look at myself in that light. But then again, those behaviors continue to bring harm to those around us. Or maybe it's coming out of my insecurity that I'm, I'm seeking to, to demonstrate something with someone else or control or manipulate them or something. One of the wisest things said about this was from the Roman playwright Terence, who, who many, many millennia ago, or two and a half millennia ago, nothing human is alien to me. So it's it's easy for me to say, well, uh, you know, I can see all your flaws, but I'm, I'm not capable of seeing mine. You know, I, I know who the enemy is. It's you, right? That's why this... This work is not narcissism and not self-absorption. It's, it's about being accountable. That's the central thing. That's one of the most important words I could use here is accountability. Um, in the second half of life, we begin to look at our history and to see some of those patterns. I mean, none of us wake up and says, well, today I'm going to do the same harmful or stupid things I've done for a long time. But we will if we stay on automatic but to begin to say, all right, but where is that coming from in you? I often ask clients to examine, you know, a certain impulse or behavior or pattern. What is that in service to inside of you? That's the key. Because one of the characteristics of shadow is we usually have, but we have to start dealing with it in some way, a ready defense or rationalization. Well, I did this because you did that, or uh, because you didn't do that. I, I did so you see, in other words, I'm just owning any responsibility for this. Freud talked about a young man who tried to disown his own dreams. He said, but, you know, there were things in my dreams I would, you know, they're not me. And Freud said, well, whose dream do you think you were just talking about? It was your dream. Your psyche embodied this. So the greatest task we can do for others is to work on our own shadow. Because one thing is clear to me, and I wrote about this in, in the book on relationship, is that no relationship with another person can be more evolved than our relationship to ourselves. Because where I'm stuck, where I'm blind, where I'm refusing to be accountable, it's gonna play out with the other person sooner or later. And that's why I, I keep looking to the other person to fix this or something like that. When in fact, the work that I have to do is my own work. That's the best thing I can do for you. Address the Karim, come at peace with it, and constantly remind yourself about its existence. The modern um, science, differs with that. They're always mentioning about that dreams being abstract, probably like you mentioned, well, like they're describing as it being no, it's just a thought process. What's your thoughts on the dreams? Because re reading religion and follower, I believe that dreams have a meaning and especially in all of the religions other than even other than Islam, prophets were able to see dreams. They had true <laughs> meanings. They had to follow. Uh, which is a higher level of state, obviously, but every dream had a meaning. I want you to know, Dr. Hollis, where do you stand on the dream part? And mm -hmm. how do humans have to address the dreams when they see something? Sure. And, and, and first of all, we have to recognize it's a natural function of the human organism. And again, nature doesn't waste energy. So it has a purpose. We have to ask that purpose. Sleep research has also told us, tells us if you reach 80 years old, and I'm 84, if you reach 80 years old, you will, have been, you will have spent six years of your life dreaming. That's not sleeping. You'll be spending up to a third of your time sleeping, but six years. That's extraordinary. And I think there are two basic reasons here. First of all, in the raw experience of stimuli that come to us every day that has to be processed, whether we pay attention or not, it's serving a natural function. The material in there has to be processed in some way. If it isn't, it will show up in some pathogenic way. Secondly, if you pay attention to it over time, you begin to realize, again, there's something in the psyche that's responding to our lives, what's happening to us, what our choices are. Who would ever make this up consciously? The autonomy of those images and the wisdom of those images that pull somebody out, 
say from childhood, you haven't seen for years. It's unlikely you're still processing the relationship with that child, but the psyche has reached in, it's like a movie director who goes to central casting and say, I, I need to have somebody to embody this issue for this person, for this interior movie that we're having here. And what's so hard about dream interpretation is we tend to look at it strictly from the standpoint of the ego. And therefore we can be frightened by our dream. We can, we can even try to manipulate our interpretation, or perhaps we can help avoid our shadow or, or we're threatened by what it might ask of us. So the ego is not that trustworthy when it comes to dream interpretation. That's why the therapist has to work with the person to help them bring out their associations with these images. Well, your psyche is not going to pay attention. It has its own autonomy, and it's going to be responding whether you like it or not. But when a dream image comes up, we have to start saying, when, when I experience that image, what are the associations I have? And if you dream of your grandmother, I dream of my grandmother, well, we had different grandmothers. What aspect of our experience is the psyche pulling on? I mean, it's really detective. You can work for hours on a single dream. Jung used to say, the beginning is, I have no idea what this dream is. It's a product of your psyche, but together we'll sort of process it together until such time as it begins to open the layers to us. Dreams often have various layers. And so over time, you begin to realize that there are certain motifs that follow, there are dream threads that follow. And to give you a quick example, I've had several people who had very negative or traumatic experiences with their with a father or mother, and their dreams initially bring up the traumatic aspect of them. And over time, as you work on that, the, the image of that parent begins to evolve, and, and you begin, so many have begun to see their, their parents as someone else's wounded child or someone else who was caught in a dilemma. And what happened to the dreamer was less personal than it seemed at the time, and more coming out of the hurt of that person's experience. And you begin to see the intrapsychic image of that parent figure evolve and be more integrated. And often there's a sense of understanding, even forgiveness that can come from that. You know, I mean, think of all the daily repetitions that we went through as children, um, absorbing what we think are the messages of our family and our culture to us. And that isn't just disappear overnight. It has to be assimilated. It has to be worked through. It has to be understood. And asking questions like, well, what does that experience make you do, or what does it keep you from doing? And that's a very pragmatic question. If you can address that question, all right, let's just say there's a certain fearfulness. We have a, a certain area of life we're called to, but we're afraid of doing it. It's coming out of our sense of having, you know, experienced trauma around that in our life or, or lack of confidence in ourselves or whatever. I mean, everybody has self esteem issues. Even the narcissist, they're the ones with the greatest problem with self esteem. That, um, you know, just say, all right, now, what is this really asking of me? And, you know, what does this make me do? What does it keep me from doing? And the moment you make that confidence, guess what? Now, ego consciousness has a new agenda. Are you going to bring to that insight the courage and the persistence necessary to actually evolve and integrate that part of your psychological history? Or is it going to be off over here and operating autonomously in your life, perhaps sabotaging your life and continuing to keep it as a, you know, a prisoner of history. There is a word mentioned in Arabic, it's called Sakina, peace, tranquility, to the extreme mm -hmm. that comes to it, because now the body and the ruh are both energies that are working in the, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And the nafs itself, there is, a, there is another ayah, 8927, says, mm -hmm. ya, and then the nafs itself, the ego also becomes mutmain meaning satisfied, meaning that it's at it's also at peace. So mm -hmm. the aim is try to align all of these thing, things together. Mm -hmm. Would that be when you you think that a human be, being as be able to face now the death ultimate yes. as well with with mm -hmm. ease? Well, certainly, um, in the Western world, as you know, we we have this word neurosis. It became a term that was invented in the 1790s by a Scottish physician, and they thought it was a, because your neurology was disturbed in some way that you have emotional symptoms. Well, you know, to get around the notion of neurology, we have to say what we've called neurosis is really the split between my adaptations, the acculturation, and the natural desire of the self to express itself in the world through me. 
Now, the more I can bring those two together, the greater I'm going to have a sense of purposefulness, sense of harmony, and so forth. And this is an ongoing work because whatever we might achieve momentarily can get out of balance since we have to deal with the challenges of life very, very quickly. So this is, you know, a daily vigilance, a daily paying attention. And of course, part of this work slowly begins to reposition that ego because the fear of death is all the ego's fear. It's not nature's issue. You know, I've, I've had the experience and the sorrow of being with people who died and, and animals who were pets that died. And generally speaking, you know, pets had no fear. They, it was a natural process for them. Or in, in the midst of life, we were death, as the old saying has it. Well, it's all around me. I can't say that I want to die. In fact, one of my chief reasons for staying alive is I happen to love my wife. I want to be there for her. She needs my help. Secondly, I'm still curious about the world. I'm still enjoying learning so much about the world. It breaks your heart at times, but you, you're still learning about the world. But there's a part of me, too, that is perfectly accepting. I do understand. We're, you know, as Jung put it, we're, we're just a, a short pause between two great mysteries. So it's not about what the mystery is. That's the mystery. <laughs> you know, it's what we come from and what we enter into is mystery. The question is, have you lived your life honestly as you could while you were here? Did you step into it? And Jung said we all walk and shoot too small for us. What he meant was we, we become our protective adaptations. And that's understandable. But the more we live that, the more we're playing out of our powerless past, the less we're identified with people and more with the soul or we're likely to realize. And in doing so, I, th I think it helps us get away from the urgencies of the ego that says, but I'm the boss and I must be in control and, and so forth. And so autonomy of the body, aging, mortality, or the ultimate uh, uh, you know, confrontations with that ego fantasy of, of being the boss. It's, it's a tiny cluster of energy and a large ocean. And rather than be threatened by that, realize that's, what a, that's the life force that's been carrying me through this. And it's not death that I fear. And what I fear is not living my life with meaning and purpose is what I fear. And that's where I'm accountable to myself and my own on a daily basis. Being honest and being humble. I think that's a beautiful message for all of our viewers um, and to myself as well. Dr. Hollis, I, I just want to thank you very much for being so generous with your time today. It's all a of pleasure to be with you have this conversation i thank you in, in turn and we all really enjoyed it we thank you very much for your time and we also wish you good health and thank uh, you. hopefully we can uh, have you back in our studio some other times because there's so many other concepts and brilliant animals and other um, parts that we have not touched on but we are mindful about the time and uh, we really really appreciate you being with us thank you very very much you're, you're quite welcome i wish you well we wish you well too. Have a blessed day, sir. Thank you. So, um...